الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين وبعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to our Friday حلقة And today as we uh, go through our journey uh, which is a thematic commentary on the Quran we have alhamdulillah completed, completed our commentary on Surah Al-Fatiha, Surah Al-Baqarah, Surah Ali Imran and Surah Al-Nisa, and today we move on to Surah Al-Ma'idah, which is Surah number 5 in the Qur'an. And it's a Surah Madaniyya, meaning it was revealed after the Hijrah, after the migration of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this means it's packed with rulings and de the details of Islamic legislation. And uh, let's take a, <coughs> some sort of a a short overview or a glimpse on the surah uh, the central or the main theme in the surah appears clearly in the first verse so it's very obvious straightforward and clear and uh, let me recite it make a short commentary and then see how it reflects on the rest of the surah أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا أوفوا بالعقود أحلت لكم بهيمة الأنعام إلا ما يتلى عليكم غير محل الصيد وأنتم حرم إن الله يحكم ما يريد All you who believe, fulfill your agreements, fulfill the contracts The animals of الأنعام They have been made halal for you to eat, meaning Cows, beef, camels, sheep, and goats. They have been made halal for you. Except what we legislated for you with regards to a specific state, and that is the state of ihram. When you are uh, in the state of ihram, which you are supposed to get into when you are performing hajj or umrah either major, hajj, major pilgrimage or minor pilgrimage. You're supposed to be in the sacred state, Al-Ihram. And when you are in this state, you are not allowed to hunt. You're not allowed to hunt. Uh, then Allah says, concludes the verse with saying, إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَحْكُمُ مَا يُرِيدُ Indeed, Allah uh, makes the rulings according to His will. And obviously, the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, is connected to his wisdom and his encompassing knowledge. So we can see, first the surah uh, calls on the believers. And that means the concept of Iman is of paramount importance here in what follows or with regards to what follows. So all you who believe, awfu bil fulfill your contracts and agreements, stay true to them. And that shows the connection between Iman and external behavior. So this the concept of commitment, truthfulness, um, uh, trustworthiness are strongly connected. All of these traits are actually can be traced back to Iman. So a sign of someone having a good faith, it might be a very likely sign of someone having a good level of faith or a good heart at least, is that they are faithful, loyal, truthful and committed to their word. So they stay true to their word and to their agreements. Then Allah uh, gives some kind of example which he's going to highlight here in Surah Al-Ma'idah with regards to Bahimat Al-An'am. Allah says, Allah has made these animals halal for you to eat. Their meat, you can, you can consume their meat as food. It's, it's permissible for you. But there is a state where you cannot actually hunt these animals. I mean, you can eat them, but you cannot hunt them. And uh, this is going to be mentioned later on in the surah, but uh, this is an agreement between us and Allah. And we're going to come to what contracts and agreements here means. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala concludes the verse, as we said, with making a very clear declara declaration, which could actually be the very core of the central theme of the surah, where Allah says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَحْكُمُ مَا يُرِيدُ Allah is the one who judges according to His will. So judgment belongs to Allah. Rulings belong to Allah. Law, legal system, 
belongs to Allah. And many people, again, through, as, throughout our commentary on the surah, we're going to probably uh, visit this concept that many people don't understand what the legal system means in terms of Islam, what legislation means. What does it mean that the rule belongs to Allah? Many people think hey, it's a specific or a fixed set of rulings uh, that are specified, we have to abide by them at all times and they are rigid and we have to abide by them uh, at all times in all places regardless of details and so on and so forth. But this is something again that has been that the media has painted and you know some some people who it was pushed this is this is agenda that was pushed by certain parties certain groups certain countries and certain uh, powers to give the general masses this impression that the legal system in Islam is just a fixed set of rigid rules that applies inhumanely and uh, irrespective of the conditions, the details, the circumstances. And this is a completely childish, simplistic understanding. And it's completely inaccurate. Alright, so let's look at the surah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts, and this is just an overview, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about uh, the rulings with regards to observing the sanctity of the rituals that Allah legislated and the sacred months. Then Allah talks about the sacrifice animals for Hajj and even people who are seeking to make Hajj, even though at that time there were non-Muslims making Hajj or pilgrimage to this sacred house. And then Allah highlights the issue of hunting again. But here there is a beautiful uh, principle that has to do with the concept of agreements, covenants, rules that we have to abide by our contracts with Allah. And there are different levels of the contracts that we have with Allah. So one of them is the details that Allah specifies in, in the revelation. But there is also a, a more abstract level. And this is the level of uh, moral, divine moral principles like justice, fairness. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here talks about, tells the believers, do not wrong people even though they, uh, in the past, they... Uh, prevented you from visiting or from performing your umrah and visiting the sacred house. Do not do injustice to them. Uh, Allah says, do not let your hatred uh, make you transgress or do not let the grudge that you have, do not let that lead you to, to transgression. And then Allah says, and establishes another moral rule that is more abstract, but it has uh, infinite uh, implications and, and manifestations. Allah says, عَلَى الْبِرِّ وَالتَّقْوَى Help one another, cooperate, support one another when it's a just, when it's about justice. Uh, and when it's about, uh, when it's something good, something moral, something of a good nature, and something of a virtuous nature. So help and support and cooperate, but do not help and support when uh, it's all about a transgression and evil and sin. So this is something Allah highlights. Then Allah talks specifically about what is permissible and not permissible with regards to animals to eat and certain conditions. Then Allah highlights a very famous verse here in the Quran, which is number three, when Allah says, Today I have uh, completed your religion for you uh, and I have uh, perfected my, my blessings upon you and I'm pleased with Islam as your way of life, as your religion. So this is highlighted within the context of the rules, the rulings, and so on and so forth. Uh, then Allah talks about uh, some rulings that pertain to hunting and animals uh, that are trained for hunt, like dogs, etc. And then Allah talks about what types of food that are permissible for the Muslims. And also, Allah highlights the issue that Muslims can marry Muslim males, Muslim men can marry women, uh, decent uh, res 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 respect respectable women, uh, chaste women from the people of the scripture. Ma Allah makes it as an exception from the general rule. The general rule is that a Muslim should marry a Muslim. But one small exception is made and that's basically uh, that a Muslim man can marry if there is a woman from among the people of the scripture, a Jew or a Christian, that is decent, uh, chaste, uh, she protects her honor, her dignity, 
and she's uh, of decent character and good manners, then it's permissible to marry such a woman. But no exception was made, for example, for a Muslim woman to marry a non-Muslim man or to marry um, a man from the people of the scripture. Then Allah talks about some rulings that pertain to, and this is uh, verse number six, Allah talks about the verse of wudu, how to perform wudu, Allah describes wudu. Then Allah emphasizes the concept of remembering Allah's favor upon us and His covenant, the covenant that we, we, ha we have with Him and that we are supposed to be true to it. Uh, and Allah emphasizes again the concept of then justice and He warns against, uh, against transgression and He emphasizes that He's a watcher over us. Then Allah shows the outcomes of people who stay truthful to Allah versus those who actually break their covenant, their very innate covenant with Allah, which is the fitrah. Human nature actually is about worshipping Allah. Human nature itself calls us, pushes us, guides us to worship, to recognize our Creator and stay true to Him and stay true to His guidance, which is again what we generally experience as moral principles as justice, as truth, and so on and so forth. So Allah says those who deny, those who act in denial to that, those who reject that, then they're going to end up in, a, in the hellfire. Um, again, Allah reminds the believers of some of His bounties upon them. And then Allah makes a reference to Bani Israel. Uh, and the context is agreement, contract. Allah says in verse number 12, وَلَقَدْ أَخَذَ اللَّهُ مِيثَاقَ بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ And Allah took the, an agreement, Allah struck a, a contract with Bani Israel. Then Allah shows how they failed to remain true to that uh, covenant. Then Allah makes a reference to the, to the Christians and how they actually grew heedless of their agreement and their contract with Allah eventually. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala renews his contract and agreement with the people of the scripture through the Quran here by reminding them that I sent Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam to revive this agreement so that to give you another chance that you come back to this agreement and honor it again. And then Allah explains the consequences of all of this and he, Allah makes some points or uh, sets some arguments here against some of the claims of the people of the scripture with regards to the nature of Allah, the nature of the divine and some of their claims. And Allah makes a historical reference here to uh, something that happened with Prophet Musa salam, Moses, peace be upon him. When, and it also highlights the concept of contract, agreement, following the rule of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, where Allah told them, you know, march to the sacred land, which is Palestine, uh, Bayt al-Maqdis. Uh, march to that land when there were very strong people living there march there in order to fight against them and Allah will give you a victory but they said no these people are you know we're outnumbered these people are stronger than us and thus they let down Musa alayhi salam and they refused although Allah promised them victory they refused to actually march to the sacred land and thus they were sent into the diaspora or a state of loss for 40 years and that's the time by the way when Musa alayhi salam died what is called, uh, that's what's known as a tih Allah refers to it in the Quran Arba'ina sanata yatihuna fil ardi here in, the, in verse number 26. Yatihuna. They would squander, they would be lost, they would roam aimlessly uh, for 40 years. Then Allah makes another reference, historical reference, but that dates back to the very beginning of humanity, which is the story of Habil and Qabil, Abel and Cain. And the the jealousy from uh, Cain or Qabil against his brother that led him to violate the contract and the agreement, the natural agreement with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ending up murdering his own uh, brother. Then Allah connects this to the violation that happened by Bani Isra Israel later on. Uh, so Allah, like Allah, draws parallels between Qabil, Cain, and Bani Israel, the way they handled the covenant and the agreement with Allah subhanahu uh, wa ta'ala. And Allah also highlights the concept of highway robbers and people who bring, spread mischief in the, and corruption in, on the land. How their punishment is very severe in this world and in the hereafter. Uh, yeah, and Allah highlights other principles. Then Allah addresses Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam 
with regards to how to handle the rejection and the disbelief of the people of the scripture, although they have all the clues and all the evidence that they need to accept uh, the mission of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and follow him. But obviously they were distorting their own scripture, they were changing it, they were playing with it, they were hiding some of it, um, they were spreading rumors and they were creating lies. Allah talks about all of this. And it is here that in verse number 44, one of, uh, one, a famous verse arrives or ending of a verse where Allah says, وَمَنْ لَمْ يَحْكُمْ بِمَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهِ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْكَافِرُونَ That those who do not rule by what Allah revealed, these are the disbelievers or these are the people who commit disbelief. Um, and again, so it shows that, this takes us to verse number one where Allah says, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَوْفُوا بِالْعُقُودِ O you who believe, Stay true to your covenants, especially the one with Allah. And as someone who's ex first being a human being is a covenant with Allah. By the way, we it's an innate. There's an innate covenant, inborn covenant with Allah that we have. As sometimes we refer to it or to certain aspects of it as human nature, human tendency, uh, as intuitive, innate, uh, built-in capacity for or or or. or or this kind of tendency to seek meaning and to seek the creator and the origin of the universe and the creator of the universe and to devote your life for a mission, for a noble mission that is bigger than yourself. So this is part of our, uh, of our covenant, natural covenant with Allah. But there is an, another level of covenant is when someone accepts the true religion, they commit to obeying the instructions, the divine guidance. And divine law. So Allah says, those who do not rule by that law which they agreed to, to, to live by, then these people are committing disbelief. And Allah uh, is mentioning this with regards to the people of the scripture. Actually, and prior to that, Allah mentions uh, that they should rule by the true scripture that was sent to them, but they actually turn away from it. And that's why Allah says, those who do not rule by what Allah revealed, then these have disbelieved. Again, back to the first verse in the surah, Allah says, O you who believe, stay true to these covenants. Now, if you do not stay true to these covenants, there is an issue with belief, with your, with your faith. Are you a true believer or not? And then Allah mentions some details about uh, the previous scriptures and the Quran itself, because they come from the same source. So there is a lot in common um, in terms of law. Although it's many of that has changed when it when it comes to the scripture, many passages have been taken out. Many of them have been interpreted or loosely translated to dilute really the intensity and the straightforward nature of some of the text. Uh, but Allah Subhanahu wa Taala also says, "Whoever does not rule by what Allah revealed, these are the oppressors. These are the wrongdoers, the dhalimun." And then Allah makes a reference to the Christians and how, how they were supposed to remain true to the book that was sent, revelation that was sent to Prophet Jesus, Isa alayhi uh, salam. And that those who do not rule by what Allah revealed, these are the, the, these are the people who have uh, diverted from the true path. These are the people who have committed you know, uh, a, a grave indecency in, in terms of their behavior. Then Allah says that He sent the Qur'an as the final revelation and the dominant revelation that puts everything else, all of the previous revelations in context and it also uh, reveals the distortions and the, uh, interrupt, uh, the, the corruption that creeped into them. And there's a famous verse here where Allah says, um, do they seek the judgment of or the rulings or the legal system of ignorance? Because I mean, I mean, humans, when they come up with the rules, they come up with rules based on their understanding and their judgment. And human understanding and judgment is limited. Whereas the divine law comes from the infinite wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you find a human being critiquing divine uh, rulings, it's either this person does not understand these rulings, which is a lot of the cases that you hear around here and there on social media, on YouTube and on media outlets. Uh, and there's also another common uh, reason, or, uh, which is basically some people have ulterior motives. People just want to attack 
you know, whether they know or not, they just want to shed some negative light on the, the revelation. And most likely they would, either they don't know it, but if they know it, they hide what they know. They hide the good things that they know. Because divine legislation is actually reflects the wisdom of the Creator. And if a person does not see the wisdom or sees the opposite of wisdom in that divine revelation, as, as I said, they either don't know it or they uh, cannot appreciate the, the, the complexity and the intensity of, of such rulings. Uh, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so, sort of advi advises the believers as to how to handle uh, people of this scripture who reject to believe in Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah warns against taking them as your closest allies um, and that you love them based on their religion. Uh, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns against this. Uh, Yet in the Quran, Allah instructs us as well to deal, to handle them and treat them with justice, fairness and good treatment. Then Allah reveals a lot of the mistakes and a lot of the violations of the people of the scripture to, towards their covenant and agreement with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This takes a good chunk of, of the surah where Allah actually re reveals some of their false practices and some of their, uh, the, the, um, some of the, uh, the beliefs, that fabricated beliefs about the nature of Allah and the nature of Prophet Isa, Jesus peace be upon him, about Trinity. Allah speaks clearly about Trinity here um, and about the nature of Prophet Isa alayhi salam. Um, yeah, so many things about the people of the scripture here. And then Allah comes back to some of the rulings within Islam, uh, things about oath, how when you make an oath and you break it, how to handle this. Again, there are rulings here. Then here there is the ruling uh, of uh, pro uh, prohibiting uh, drinking, the drinking of alcohol, making it haram, uh, gambling, uh, uh, yeah, and uh, mausoleums, you know, and uh, festivals that have to do with idol worship and so on and so forth. Um, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes them haram. And again, this is a surah about divine rulings. And it's about our covenant and agreement to abide by these divine rulings. So many of them are actually explained here in detail. And Allah talks in, about some of them in detail. Then Allah comes to talk about the issue of hunting when you are in a state of ihram, the sacred state of performing hajj. Allah makes a reference to the Kaaba, the sacred house. Uh, in Mecca, and there are so many other detailed rulings here that Allah explains to the believers. Some things about, you know, even the will of a dying person, how to handle that and how to have witnesses for it. And then finally, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes a reference to, Prophet, to the Day of Judgment, and here he brings up the concept of, uh, or the notion of Prophet Isa alayhi salam and his history, and uh, the true believers in Isa alayhi salam, his true disciples, um, and an incident that happened with them when, 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 when the true followers of Isa alayhi salam asked for a feast to be given to them from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it, it came down from the, the heavens down to them. Uh, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about something that's going to happen which is a conversation that is going to happen between Allah and Jesus and Masih alayhi salam on the day of judgment where Allah is going to Question Prophet Isa alayhi salam, did you tell, as these people claim, did you tell them to worship you and your mother? And Isa alayhi salam would deny that and say, it was not for me to call them to worship other than you. And this is actually what the surah uh, closes with, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, basically those who remain truthful, those who remained upon the truth, and that's covenant, that's agreement, that's abiding by divine law. These people, they, Allah will be pleased with them, they would they will be pleased with him and they will get the uh, they will be in paradise and this is the ultimate you know act of winning and everything belongs to Allah and he is capable of everything so this is an overview of the of the surah and now let's just take the first 5 pages as usual and try to you know just highlight them and talk about them briefly and show how 
again, all of that connects to one central theme in the surah, which is again, um, is basically about faith, about rule belongs to Allah, legislation, defining things, good, bad, uh, permissible, impermissible, belongs to Allah because He is the one who knows everything and He's the most wise and He's the most merciful. And humans are supposed to remain truthful and loyal to their agreements. And uh, these agreements come at different levels. Let me speak about the levels. So there's the natural level, which is our fitrah, innate nature of embracing good, recognizing good, recognizing and seeking our creator, meaning of our life, the purpose of our life, and trying to live a purposeful life, a life of meaning, trying to uh, dedicate our lives for a meaningful cause that is bigger than ourselves. And obviously this is a connection to the divine. So we are supposed to make our journey, make our way back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to our creator. That's a covenant that we are born with. It's, it's an inborn innate quality. We're supposed to be truthful to it. And Islam ultimately is about being truthful to your human nature in this sense. But there is a higher level or a heightened level, an emphasized level of that connection, which is when you actually accept the revelation and you decide to follow it. So in Islam, when you pronounce the shahada, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah, I bear witness that there is none worthy of worship, no one worshipped in truth but Allah, and that Muhammad وسلم, is his final uh, prophet and messenger. Uh, that you, you live by that. So you say, I'm going to live by even the details of the revelation that was given to Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and I'm going to be uh, sincere. In all, I'm going to seek the face of my Lord. I'm going to seek my Lord in everything I do. I'm not going to do anything for any other purpose. I'm not going to do good things and acts of worship you know, to get some kind of recognition or admiration or any kind of payoff. All what I want is Allah. So you live with sincerity and obedience of the Prophet, of the instructions that were given to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So this is a heightened or a second level of covenant and agreement. And the more a person grows in Iman, that, that is they learn more, they do more, then there is more obligation upon them. There is more... Uh, there, there's more to that contract between them and Allah subhanahu wa, uh, wa ta'ala. So, Iman grows, sort of more expectations grow because you have uh, sort of evolved into a higher level. So thus, your, your behavior, the, the way of, of, of life as well should reflect the state of, of your heart. And this is why, for example, you find scholars they have more obligations in terms of teaching and educating and fixing mistakes than non-scholars. Uh, people who have, have been given power and might within an Islamic system, there's more obligations up, obligation upon them to set things right and fix mistakes and help the, the needy and the oppressed and so on and so forth. Yeah, so we're just going to go over the uh, first five pages, inshallah, uh, or the first two Okay, two sections of, of the surah, insha'Allah ta'ala, and see how it connects to the central theme. So Allah says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu awfu bil uqood, all you who believe, uh, stay loyal, fulfill your agreements, your contracts, your covenants. So first, uh, Allah draws on faith, on belief. O you who believe, your faith and belief necessitates remaining truthful because faith itself is an act of even by virtue of the English word faith you remain faithful you, it means you remain faithful to your human nature you don't depart you don't depart that human nature. You, don't, you don't split from it you remain truthful to it and that means you remain truthful to your creator uh, you, you remain loyal to him and Islam comes to actually uh, consolidate this and give it the final shape because our intellect is unable to figure out all the details of how this manifests itself in the world. So Allah combined the fitrah with divine guidance, with revelation, so that uh, we have a complete recipe, a detailed recipe as to how we should carry ourselves in this life. So this faith necessitates that you actually even your dealings, outside dealings, external dealings with Allah, with others, with yourself, with everything, you remain truthful, loyal to your contracts and agreements. So you can be trusted. Um, 
you do not run away, you do not back off with regards to your commitments. Um, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, for example, if you have a truce, you have an agreement, you have a contract, you are supposed to be truthful to it. Even if circumstances allow you to get away with violation, you cannot. Why? Because circumstances are not moral boundaries for you. Your moral boundaries come from another dimension and that's the inner dimension of who we are and that's our faith. That's our worldview and that's our place in the world and our commitment to Allah which is a commitment to the truth itself. So this is why uh, if you know, a system, a government collapses, a true believer is supposed to be someone who would stay truthful, loyal and not make any violation, not go and steal or, or, or vandalize or destroy or create problems or take advantage of the situation. Because it's not the law that, uh, or fear of punishment that makes them abide by the truth. It's actually their, it's their belief, it's their nature, it's their human nature, it's the faith they have in Allah that they honor and they observe and they follow. Um, it's their love of Allah that makes them and their affiliation with the truth that makes them stay true to it because that's who they are. Yeah, so Allah mentions details here as we said about um, that certain types of animals are made halal for you to eat and we mentioned it's cows, uh, uh, camels, sheep and goats. So these are halal for you but if you're in a state of sacred state of ihram, you're making pilgrimage, you cannot hunt. Although I in, someone else can hunt for you, you can still eat them in that sense. But hunting, the very act of hunting is itself, uh, is itself haram. إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَحْكُمُ مَا يُرِيدُ Indeed, Allah rules as He wills. And uh, we have always to see this in context. Some people, uh, they sort of bring human qualities to Allah or to attributes of Allah and that makes it very problematic. Some people think, oh, Allah rules as He wills, so that means He's going to rule randomly. That's not how things happen. Because Allah's will is not separated from His wisdom, justice, mercy, knowledge, etc. Right? So, and this, this applies as well to the common phrase that whomever Allah guides, none can misguide, and whoever Allah misguides, none can guide. People think, oh, Allah does that randomly. I'm just cherry picking. But that's not the case. Allah, Allah's choices and Allah's actions uh, are all done according to His infinite knowledge, wisdom, uh, mercy, uh, uh, and, and justice. So, uh, again, everything should be seen in context. There's no need to mention all of these names and attributes every time something like this is mentioned. It's understood. It's just become part of the context. Uh, otherwise, communication becomes very impractical in that sense. Okay, so this shows the central theme and the overall theme of the surah that it's about remaining, about honoring contracts at all levels. We said the natural human level and then at the level of religion, accepting the revelation and following the rules of Allah and then following detailed legislation and also your agreements with people. I have a contract with you. I'm supposed to stay truthful to it. The Prophet ﷺ says, al mu'minuna." In the shurutihim, the believers would abide by the conditions they agree to. I have a contract between you and me. I'm supposed, by, by virtue of my faith, I'm supposed to be truthful to it and loyal. Even if, even if I can violate it and get away with it, I can't. Islamically, I, morally, I can't. So, um, even... And this is a, let's say this is a written agreement. There are sometimes verbal agreements. These also have to be observed. Oftentimes you find people today, you know, when it comes to verbal agreement, they, you know, they don't take it seriously. Why? Because they can get away with it, probably without legal consequences. But when it comes to faith, it's not about documenting something. It's like really a violation. It becomes a slight to your faith and it brings your faith down. It starts affecting your heart. So you live in this ecosystem of faith, morality, truth and every change or every violation there sort of affects everything. 
Um, and there is unspoken, there's unspoken agreements like uh, there are social codes of, of how to behave and how to carry yourself in public, for example, and how to people interact. They're not specified, they're not written in a book or in a, in a, in a, in a record or they're not really openly discussed. It's just people happen to conquer upon them. People happen to agree and see eye to eye with regards to these. These are covenants and agreements, by the way. Um, and, and they make, they, they are the sort of grease of life. So, generally speaking, as long as these unspoken rules, they do not go, they do not go against Islam, they do not go against a bigger truth, then to some level they become binding. Again, this is a very loose statement. They become binding to a certain extent and generally speaking. I mean, uh, b these are very dynamic and it's very impractical to write each one of them down. It just because life becomes unbearable. So why? Because life is very uh, versatile and situations are diverse and, 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 and rules. these rules are very malleable. Still, but there is some consistency in them. So, and this is what we call common sense, right? So Islam encourages us to observe these and, and, uh, and w because without this, people won't feel safe, by the way. Like if, if you walk into, let's say, a supermarket or a store and behave different than the norms, accepted norms in your locality, people would feel threatened automatically. The survival mode kicks in. If, if you're having a conversation with someone, you start acting weirdly, against the norms. Maybe this way of acting is okay in another country or according to another culture, but in this specific culture, you, act, you, you are behaving in a way that is not uh, n normal and natural and is not, is not the norm here in this, in this, let's say, in this society. Automatically, people will, be, will feel threatened and people won't be comfortable dealing with you. People will start avoiding you. People will start being suspicious about you. Some people might actually call the police on you. On you. Why? B again, because these are contracts. These are subtle, unspoken contracts. And a wise person pays close attention to these things. And I'm not saying follow all of them, but I'm just saying being aware of them and being very responsive to them and considerate of them is a sign of wisdom and a sign of a higher level of faith as well. All right. So then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, there is some reference made to Hajj here in Surah Al-Ma'idah. There is, the, towards the end as well, a reference to the Kaaba. Uh, and there are some rulings. So here, first reference here appears that Allah says to the believers, do not violate the uh, legislations of Allah, the rituals that Allah established. Wala shahar al-haram, no, the sacred months, um, with all the rulings that come with them. And know the sacrifice animals or the animals that have been brought for sacrifice, for pilgrimage, or people who are uh, seeking the sacred house to make hajj. Uh, and then Allah says, when you, when you break from the state of ihram, you can go back normal to, to, to the normal state of hunting, that's fine. Then Allah says, do not let your hatred of a people due to the fact that they pushed you away from the house, that they... Uh, prevented you uh, from, um, you know, approaching the house of Allah, the Kaaba, to worship. Do not make this grudge that you have against them. Due to that, do not let this lead you to transgression, to act inappropriately. Appro appro inappropriately, you have a code of ethics that you are supposed to stay true to. Even if you have the power, you can't abuse it. I mean, legally you might, and you might get away with it, but with Allah you don't. And with your heart, with your fitrah, you actually can't. It's a violation and it's going to leave a mark and it's going to create damage. And then Allah establishes another beautiful principle we said, and cooperate, help one another uh, upon goodness, anything that is good. And this shows that everything that is inherently good is actually part of Islam. It's called birr. Anything that is inherently good is automatically part of Islam with taqwa and it's a higher level of you know virtue so help one another when it comes to these things and that shows Allah this is an open statement so if there is a good cause and you find it wise to 
help out in this good cause, go ahead. But you have to make a good judgment of the situation and the sort of the consequences, maybe sometimes um, distant consequences. You have to be aware of a situation. And do not cooperate or help one another when it comes to evil in general. And this shows any type of evil is automatically against Islam. Uh, and uh, um, transgression. And fear Allah, be mindful, be loving and fearful of Allah. He is indeed severe in punishment. Then Allah mentions the things that are haram for us to eat. Uh, dead animals. Animals just, just happen to die. Uh, blood, flowing blood. Um, uh, swine. Uh, and whatever was slaughtered for other than Allah. So something that was the name of Allah was not mentioned upon. Al-Munkhaniqa. Any animal that suffocated to death. You can't eat it again. Uh, al uh, an animal that is that became ill, very ill somehow, uh, or developed some kind of skin. Some scholars say it's a skin-like uh, ailment that hits some animals and causes them eventually to die. Do not eat them, and do not eat an animal that sort of fell off like a high place, a cliff, for example, and died. Don't eat it, and an animal that died because another uh, animal sort of uh, pushed it or killed it. Uh, sp like those, Allah gives examples of those that were killed by, by the beast, by lions, tigers, shita, whatever. Uh, except what you managed to kill, like if you managed, if you caught them, still there is breath in them, there is life in them, and then you slaughtered them, then this, this is, could be an exception. And whatever was slaughtered uh, upon uh, idols, false gods, and so on and so forth. وَأَن تَسْتَقْسِمُوا بِالْأَزْلَامِ تَسْتَقْسِمُوا بِالْأَزْلَامِ is basically casting the lots. Like you want to go on a trip. You say, okay, I'm going to cast the lots and see if it says go, I'll go. If it says don't go, I won't go. Or they used to, for example, have a pigeon or some kind of a, a bird and then have this bird in their hands and let go of it. If it went to the right side, if it flew to the right side, they would say, Okay, I would do it. If, it. if the bird flew to the left side, they would say, I would not do it. Again, uh, this is something bad omen, God, uh, this is bad omen about bad omen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, no, this is haram made haram for you. Then Allah says, Today, Allah says, today, I think this was revealed around four, four after hijrah, something like this. Uh, because... No, this actually was revealed towards the end. Uh, this actually was revealed towards the end, just before the, maybe the last year before the, uh, the, the passing of the Prophet ﷺ. I mixed that with another verse about uh, alcohol, which is going to come, inshallah. Uh, so this was revealed towards the end of the life of the Prophet ﷺ. Actually, some scholars argue that this was probably, maybe the last, but it's actually not. This is not the strongest opinion. But it was among the last verses that were, that were revealed to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah says, Today the disbelievers have despaired of putting an end uh, to your religion, to Islam growing. That's it. From now on, Islam is going to be an undeniable force and uh, a, a main player uh, you know, in, in, the, in the global scene. It's always going to be there. It cannot be annihilated. That's it. So do not fear them and fear me. And Allah says, today, today I have completed your religion for you and I have perfected my favor upon you uh, and I am pleased with uh, Islam as, uh, as your religion, as your way of life, the way, which is the covenant, the agreement between you and me. Then Allah says, and whoever is in a state of necessity and uh, they're not just being lenient and they're not like seeking uh, to violate the law, then, and this is a reference to the beginning of the surah, which is basically what is haram for you. So dead animals, carcass, is haram for you to eat. But let's say someone gets lost in the desert and all they find is a dead animal. Are they just going to starve to death or can they eat from it? They can eat from it only what's enough to keep them alive. Only what's necessary to keep them alive. This is an exemption that is made because now preserving a life is becomes a higher priority than just... You know, eating once or twice from 
something that is prohibited. So this shows there's a hierarchy when it comes to haram. There's a hierarchy when it comes to halal. There's a hierarchy when it comes to wajib, obligation. And we have to observe this. Ab applying things blindly is very unwise. And many times situations will force a trade off. So you have to choose. So uh, being unaware of the hierarchy and, and the order of, of rulings is, is going to be very, very problematic. Um, okay, I, I, was, I was hoping that we could finish the five pages, but it seems that we have spent some, uh, I believe, a good amount of time uh, talking about the, the surah in general. So let's, let's stop here and uh, at the end of verse number three. And inshallah ta'ala, next week hopefully we will make up for this and we'll go over the following five pages. Uh, ta'ala. Jazakum uh, for joining us and hope to see you next Friday. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.